Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. My name is uh, Kate Hansen Bunt, and I'm the leader of the Norwegian Atlantic Committee. On behalf of the committee, I'm both proud and honored to welcome you to this afternoon event with one of the world's most renowned contemporary historians, Professor Timothy Snyder. Timothy Snyder is a Richard C. Levine Professor of History at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Science in Vienna. His work is known worldwide and has resulted in several prizes and awards, one among many, the Hannah Arendt Prize in Political Thought. Some of Snyder's uh, latest books are Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin from 2010, Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning from 2015, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, and The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America from last year, which will be the focus of today's lecture. We have one and a half hour at our disposal and have decided to break it up into three. First, Professor Snyder will give his lecture. Then we have invited uh, Dr. Asle Toya, member of the Nobel Committee, uh, and a well-known researcher in international politics in order to engage in a conversation with Professor Snyder up on the stage. The last 10, 15 minutes, we will give you, dear audience, the chance to ask questions directly to Professor Snyder. We are done uh, 17.30 sharp and have to be out of this room as soon as possible due to another event starting up at 18 hour. However, you will have the chance to meet Professor Snyder in the bookstore immediately after the event is finished. Here you may buy a signed copy of his two latest books available both in English and Norwegian. Please help me to welcome up on stage Professor Timothy Snyder. Thank you very much for the, is that on? Thank you, no, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I, I, I'm impressed, I've been impressed these last couple of days with Norwegian punctuality. There, there, there are other cultures which claim to be punctual, like the German, but they are lying. Um, <laughs> these are, I, I've now had several events in a row which have actually started to the second when they are supposed to start, and I want you to know that you're special, that no one else, <laughs> no, no one else does that. Um, I, so uh, whenever I wear a, a, a headset microphone like this, I always think of the 1980s and um, aerobics, and um, I feel the temptation to lead people in some kind of exercise. You'll, <laughs> you'll also, <laughs> um, like this. Um, what I'm not. You'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to do that. But what what I would like to ask you to do is to join me in stretching mentally a little bit. Um, as Kate has kindly indicated in the introduction, what I'll be talking about is a book called The Road to Unfreedom, which is a contemporary history of the West, of Russia, Europe, and the US from about 2010 to about 2018. But in the 40 minutes or so that I have left, since I too will try to be punctual, um, w I won't be going through the nitty gritty of the book. Instead, what I'd like to try to do is think about the larger question of the book, which is why is democracy having such a hard time, um, even in Europe and in North America? Or perhaps the question which is even larger than that, which is why has politics become so strange in the last few years? Because it's not just that human rights are in danger, democracy is retreating, the extremes seem to be doing better. There's also a certain uncanny character to what's going on. The people who are emerging in the center of European politics or American politics, it's not that they're just opponents of democracy, it's that they seem to stand for something which is often just downright 
strange, which reminds me, I'd be very happy to talk about President Trump and the question and answer, um, and uh, he'll come up a bit in this talk, but partly I'm also trying to get a certain distance on him and see him as part of a larger phenomenon. So what's the larger phenomenon? Um, let me begin by asking a basic question of political theory, which is what comes before politics? What is, what is the question that you ask before you establish a political system? So if you think back to the 20th century and the old competition between fascism, communism, liberal democracy, the fascist answer to the question of what comes before politics is the distinction between friends and enemies. Politics begins when I define my enemies. And then once I have my enemy defined, I can move on from there. Marxists would say politics begins with the economy. Politics begins with changes in the modes of production. That comes first, we draw our conclusions from there. And Democrats or liberals rather <clears throat> would say something like politics begins with the social contract. There was a moment, real or imagined, when a bunch of people sat around a table, real or imagined, and drew up a constitution or some founding agreement which sets the rules by which citizens would recognize citizens and elect their own rulers. Now, what I wanna suggest is that as we're moving into the 21st century, something has changed so that these questions about what politics means have also started to change. Uh, the, 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 what, I, what I have in mind is the character of this globalization. So I'm a historian, so I say this globalization because there have been other globalizations. The one that I'm concerned about is this globalization, this 21st century globalization. And rather than saying that it's new and nothing like this has ever happened before, um, I'm going to ask what is different about this globalization as compared to the previous ones. And it seems to me that what's different about this globalization is that it's not really about space, or it's not about space in the same way that the last globalization, the imperial globalization, was. So by the last globalization, I mean the period from about the 1880s to about the 1930s or, or, or 40s. If we, if we think about these questions about politics or what comes before politics in the last globalization, we see answers that have to do with space. So when Marxists come to power in the Soviet Union, their answer about what to do with economics in space is we colonize ourselves. We take this one sixth of the Earth's surface that we control and we modernize it rapidly. We exploit the Earth, we exploit our own people, we, we, create, um, we create technological modernity. The fascists also have an answer about space, which is once we've chosen our enemies, then we take their land. Um, in the case of Nazi Germany, this meant above all the land of the Western Soviet Union, above all the land of Ukraine. But here's where things get interesting. Things get interesting with democracy. I think here we see a kind of weak point in the history of democracy and a weak point in the history of the social contract. And I think in some way this is the problem that many democracies, not yours of course, which I'm sure is doing you know, perfectly well, but many, um, <laughs> um, but many, that many democracies are facing, the idea of a social contract historically has assumed that, yes, we all accept the rules, except when we don't. So in the United States, there's, th there's this idea of go west, young man. So yes, we have a constitutional republic here on the East Coast, but we have this huge zone of exception, right, the frontier. And if you don't like the rules, we have a whole continent where no one is playing by them, and you can go out there. This is true for European empires in general. There may be something like democracy around London, but there's not democracy in the British Empire. There may be something like democracy in Lexagon, but there's, nothing, there, there's very limited or no democracy in the rest of the French Empire. One can go through the examples from the Netherlands to Belgium, but you take the general point. The history of democracy in Europe is often, is, is almost always, in fact, also the history of empire which means it's the history of having space to send people to, whether they are troublemakers, adventurers, prisoners, simply surplus young males, whatever it might be, there was always space. I think that what's happening in the broadest possible sense now is that we're globalizing without space. There isn't really space to send people to. 
And insofar as people are moving, that feels like a problem rather than opportunity, right? Both in Europe and the United States, there is this specter of immigration. The numbers may not be that big. In some places, the number is zero. But the, the idea of movement through space is not seen as an opportunity. It's experienced rather as a threat. And I think this is the thing which characterizes our, our globalization. <coughs> now, if you'll follow me in this mental stretching just one more step, I'll then promise to get more concrete and specific. What I think is interesting about this is that if you can't move through space, the only dimension of politics which is left is time, right? That there's a kind of law of political relativity that space and time work together, but that if you run out of space, all that's left is time. And I think if we, if we look at it this way, the last 30 years or so, and indeed the present moment, start to clarify a bit. Because I think what we've had in the last 30 years is a kind of politics of time, which we haven't really recognized as such, and which I'm going to try to explain in the next few minutes. But let me just give you a couple of hints to, to, to suggest what I'm trying to think about. One of them is this. Think about the future. It's hard, right, to think about the future. It didn't used to be so hard. In, it, it, in, the, in the history of Western political thought, thinking about the future used to be one of the things that we were best at. From the middle of the 18th century through the 1980s or 1990s, it was actually characteristic of Western political thought that we had multiple competing visions of what the future was going to be like, and many of them were actually good and desirable. Something has happened so that that's no longer true. Right? I, I mean, people who are 30 and under have actually been raised in Europe and the US without a notion that there are multiple competing good versions of what the future might be like. That's new. Or to, to make the point in a slightly different way, think about the so-called populists. The so-called populists are campaigning against the status quo. OK, that's normal. But they're campaigning against the status quo without a vision of the future. <laughs> that didn't used to be allowed. <laughs> It used to be that if you were going to campaign against the status quo, you had to have some kind of vision of the future, even a reactionary vision of the future, right? But some kind of vision of the future. But now we take it as normal that you can campaign against the status quo in this severely passive aggressive way where you're only against, but you don't really ever say what you are in fact for. Another way to think about this problem with the future is to think about, think about it as being privatized or colonized. I don't know how, how this feels in Norway, but in the United States, discussions of the future are, are heavily monopolized by a few individuals who have ideas like, I'm going to go to Mars and live forever. Um, that, you know, the fact, and that takes up the space, right? I, I, I could, there's a comedy version of this talk where I just talk about Silicon Valley in the future, and I want you to know that I'm gonna cut that off right now. Um, but but the, the tragic part of that, of that comedy is that these highly privatized, individualized versions of the future fill up the space which might otherwise be accorded to a general discussion about where the future should be, which in the US is also not happening. So if, the, if, if I'm right that the politics of time is the interesting new thing about our globalization, how would we describe the politics of time? Let me start with, I think, with, with the concept that I think explains or describes a lot of what happened after 1989. Um, it's a term I use in the book, and I can just kind of gesture at it here. It's called the, the politics of inevitability. So by the politics of inevitability, I mean progress. I mean the idea that after the end of communism, nothing more was possible. That since communism and fascism have both been discredited, liberal democracy is left over, and to repeat something which people said over and over and which forces, I mean, every time I s hear it, it makes m takes a, a day off the end of my life, so don't use it in questions and answers, please. Um, there are no alternatives, right? That this, the way things are is simply the way things are going to be. The politics of inevitability says the status quo is good, and the future is going to be more like the status quo, except there's, it's going to be bigger and better. Right? It's going to be 25% bigger and better than, than the present. Um, and the 25% is not exactly a joke. The key word of the politics of inevitability is optimization. We have good things. We're simply going to make those good things better. Now, of course, what this means is that you, there's no point in asking what is good since what you have is all you're ever going to get. 
right? There's no point asking what is good because the status quo is good. It's obvious the status quo is good. And perhaps more dangerously, there's no room for responsibility here because if capitalism is automatically gonna bring democracy or if Europe is automatically gonna bring democracy or some larger force is gonna organize history for you, then individual responsibility is completely meaningless. That follows also from the politics of inevitability. And the politics of inevitability also takes a certain very specific line towards facts. Um, it pretends to like facts, but what it really does with facts is that it works them into its story of progress. So something bad happens, banking crisis, real estate crisis, financial crisis, we work those facts into the narrative. These things are just bumps in the road. They're not a sign of any structural problem because there's no such thing as a structural problem. Um, they're, just, they're just things that we have to work into reality. The word that's used here is narrative, right? There's a reason why the word narrative has jumped out of literary studies where it belongs and now is used in everything, right? Um, it's, 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 one of these, it's one of these words which I find quite dangerous. It's a sign that something's gone wrong when we talk about narrative instead of truth or narrative instead of factuality or narrative instead of verifiability. So the politics of inevitability is about a narrative of, of progress. The politics of inevitability also assumes that technology is always good. The technology is the same thing as enlightenment. Now, of course, um, as we know, there are, in fact, alternatives. The way that the politics of time is shifting, I think, is away from this idea of inevitability towards something else which I call the politics of eternity. Uh, the two are very much related, by the way. So mine is not a story of good guys and bad guys, right? What I'm saying is that politicians of inevitability, by which I mean, you know, New Labor, the U.S. Democratic Party, Social Democrats who move towards the center, um, the p politicians of inevitability, uh, in a way, prepare, prepare the way for politicians of eternity. In other words, I'm trying to make an argument which isn't just that there are nice Democrats out there and there are bad authoritarians out there, and isn't it too bad that the nice Democrats are losing and the bad authoritarians are winning? I think that sort of argument can never be useful. There has to be an argument which, which leads us to where you know people make mistakes or where our ideas have led us in the wrong direction. That's what I'm trying to do. So the politics of eternity says there's no future. Right? The politics of inevitability says there's one future, we all know what it is, it's liberal democracy for everybody. The politics of eternity says no future. Time is just a cycle, the same thing happens over and over again, those bad outsiders are coming for our good, innocent virtues. It is, by the way, always the same, it always says that. No one has a national myth which says we're guilty and they're innocent, right? It only, it only seems attractive when you're on the inside of it. If you're not on the inside of it, it seems incredibly boring to hear over and over again, right? The Chinese are innocent, the Russians are innocent, the Americans are innocent. It's really very tiresome, all of this innocent victim business, especially when practiced by the greatest powers in the history of the world. Facebook is also innocent. What did they do? It's not their fault, right? Everybody is always innocent. Um, that's what the politics of eternity says. It's a timeless story in which we on the inside are good and all that ever happens is that people are coming for us. Migrants, Chinese, Jews, whatever it might be. Um, so this is the way, of course, that, that populism works. The politics of eternity, in a way, just takes the next logical step from the politics of inevitability. One future, no futures. Manipulation of facts to total disregard of facts. So the politicians of eternity are the ones, like Mr. Putin or like Mr. Trump, who say there is no reality, it's all a matter of subjectivity, it's all a matter of emotions, you feel some way, but I feel some stronger way, and I've got 60 million Twitter followers, right? All that matters, I don't really have, that's Trump, not me. Um, I, don't, I don't think, I've never looked, I don't think I have 60 million though. Um, the, the, so the idea is that if it's all about emotion, then spectacle is going to win. Right? And here, of course, is a place where people on the left have a moment to be a little thoughtful and critical about, about our or their ideas towards factuality and truth in the 1980s and 1990s, which has opened us up to some of this. Um, so the, the, the factual world is totally irrelevant. Um, technology is now instrumentalized to deliberately spread not just lying, but also total skepticism about everything. Right? So as you might have noticed, the internet is mainly a tool to spread not just disinformation, but more fundamentally, dis distrust. Um, the internet, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's sad, but the internet has basically made us all stupider than we were 10 years ago. 
And if you haven't noticed this yet, <laughs> anyway, th th that might be a better late than never kind of moment, right? <laughs> because it is at a certain point, you're just not going to notice. <laughs> okay. And I, I wish that were a joke, but it's, it's funny, but it's not, it's not a joke. So the politics of eternity, whereas the politics of inevitability is optimistic about technology, the politics of eternity instrumentalizes digital technology to divide us um, and to distract us and to, and to, and to polarize us. Okay, so, um, this, so now I'm gonna try to bring this down to earth a little bit. I hope that like, you've recognized politicians or ideas within these two larger descriptions. Because what, what, now, what I now want to try to explain is this otherwise slightly confusing business of the rise of the Russian Federation in international politics. Right? Why, is, why is Russia so important? And this is a question which I realize is not as strange in Norway as it is in other places because you have a border with Russia. Um, but but if, it, if you're looking at the world from California or from Britain or from France, it's a bit strange that Russia has suddenly occupied such a central place. Or to put it a different way, if you're inside the politics of inevitability, then the rise of Russia is very hard to explain. Because if you're inside the politics of inevitability, you say, well, their economy is very small, they don't export anything, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't, they don't invent anything, therefore they can't really matter. Which was, ba which was, by the way, the attitude of the Obama administration, right? That's, that's what we said. That was our official position. Russia's only a regional power, which, in, which wasn't true and also wasn't a very smart thing to say. But that's the politics of inevitability talking. You think you're an economic determinist, so you say, well, they have a small economy. They have no future. They've s they, they're, off the they're off the beaten track. Um, they don't matter. They're, they're, they're marginal. So why can Russia matter, or why does Russia matter so much? The answer, I think, is that Russia is further along in the politics of eternity than anyone else. That Russia represents a kind of magnetic pole of the politics of eternity, and as such, pulls other countries towards it a little bit um, deliberately. Okay, what do, what do I, or first of all, why would that be true? I think it's partly true because what, what Russia has gone through the politics of inevitability faster than other people. So if you think way back to the end of the Cold War or way back to the end of the Soviet Union, the 1970s and 1980s, communism was also a politics of inevitability. Communism was also, I'm not just picking on capitalism here, folks. I'm also going to pick on communism. Communism was also a politics of inevitability. Communism also said a certain economic setup leads to a certain political setup, but in the Soviet Union by the 1970s, which is when Mr. Putin or Mr. Lukashenko were growing up, no one believed that anymore. That politics of inevitability had already worn itself out, and people's main attitude towards politics was, you guessed it, nothing is true, you can't really trust people, might makes right, right? Only emotions matter, and my emotions matter more than anyone else's. So. The people who are now in power in places like Russia and Belarus have already moved through a politics of inevitability before the end of the Soviet Union. And then at the end of the Soviet Union, in the early 1990s, they move very quickly through the American politics of inevitability. In other words, capitalism is going to bring about democracy. It doesn't matter how bad your, or how illegal or how gangster style your capitalism is. It's better to do it really quickly because that's going to bring about the right kinds of political changes. I wish I were exaggerating, but I'm only exaggerating a tiny bit. That was basically the idea. And of course, if you're Russia or anyone else who actually has that experiment in trying to have capitalism without the rule of law, you're not going to believe that capitalism brings about democracy. So by the end of the 90s, Russians have already moved through both or two ideas of the politics of inevitability. Then Russia, before we do, gets to um, a kind of logical extreme of the politics of eternity. Wh why is that? Well. It has to do with the structure, the consolidated structure of the current Russian state. For one thing, the, the Russian state now um, is a, is, sorry, I'm in Nor Norway. It's a, it's a hydrocarbon oligarchy. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a place where the, where, I mean, not only export income, but the, but the wealth of the oligarchs who run the country is based usually directly, sometimes indirectly, on exports of natural gas and secondarily oil. If you are a hydrocarbon oligarchy, then you don't like the future because the future is, is, is global warming. And Russia, by the way, 
is not just a global warming denier, Russia is pro-global warming, which I think is the better way to make this distinction. I think the idea that people deny global warming is not quite right. There are people who deny it because they're for it, right? Um, they want it to happen, and Russia would be in that category. And it's not, it's not a coincidence that the parties and individuals that the Russian Federation supports inside Europe are also global warming deniers, or I would say rather advocates, or friends of global warming, to coin a phrase. Um, the second reason is that it is an oligarchy. If you're an oligarchy, that means that there isn't social mobility because wealth is already concentrated. It's very hard to it's very hard to advance. In other words, your citizens don't have a sense of the future themselves, and therefore you have to govern without the future. And the third reason is succession problems, which Russia has in abundance. So. Um, Democracy needs arguments, right? One of the arguments for democracy is that with democracy, you know that your state is going to continue. I think that's a pretty good argument, by the way. If, you, if your leader gets sick or dies or loses an election or just has had enough and decides to you know, immigrate to Gibraltar or whatever, you, know, you have legal procedures that determine what's going to come next. That's the virtue of democracy. It keeps the state going. I think that's very significant, by the way. We're in a kind of honeymoon with authoritarianism right now. Um, and the, th the thing about honeymoons is that during the honeymoon, you only see the good side, right? So I think with authoritarianism, you have to think of it as like, you've, you're, you're in like a, you're, you've, you just, you've married like this middle-aged guy, and, he, and this middle-aged guy is attractive because he like, he likes to break all the rules, right? Like he's a bad boy, and you've kind of, you've kind of gone for that, right? The, the middle-aged guy who's breaking all the rules, um, like the rules of democracy. That's the honeymoon that we're having with authoritarianism right now. I, I like the women who are looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. Like <laughs> that, that is very encouraging. Good. I'm glad you're not following this analogy. That's good. <laughs> That's reassuring. Um, but just work with me. Um, so, but the thing, about the, the thing about this honeymoon period is that it may be attractive for a while, but eventually, you know, the guy who's breaking all the rules turns out that when he breaks all the rules, then you don't know what's going to happen next. Right? You don't know what's going to happen next. This is the problem with Erdogan. This is the problem with, with Putin. This is the problem with a Trump who says he's not going to respect the outcome of, of elections if he loses, is that you don't know what's going to happen next. And because we're in a kind of young stage of authoritarianism, we've forgotten about this problem. But this is the basic problem, the problem of succession. The Russian elite hasn't forgotten about this problem. Which is, which is the third reason why you can't talk about the future in Russia. And here I mean you literally can't talk about it. You can't go to Moscow and hold up a sign which says, what happens when Putin dies? That is physically impossible to do, and I'm not even going to say try it, because that's not a joke, you'll be hurt. Um, so in these senses, in these strong senses, the future doesn't exist, and it hasn't existed for a while. This is why the Russians are ahead of the rest of us in the politics of eternity. Um, the way the politics of eternity works at home is that you create a politics of spectacle, an eternal us and them, where Russia is the protector of the true European virtues, which turn out mainly to be sexual virtues, uh, and, and Europe and the West is, th is eternally threatening to Russia. This is the technique for doing this is television. It's a fake plurality of television channels, which in fact transmit together the same basic message. The way you do this abroad is a little bit more interesting. You do it by way of the internet. And the, the technique or the strategy is, is what I would call strategic relativism. What do I mean by this? Russian nationalism in 2019 is different than any other nationalism, I think, in the history of the world. Um, Russian nationalism in 2019 says the following. It says, yes, we lie. We lie all the time. Yes, we steal. We steal all the time. We don't deny that. But it's our lying and it's our stealing. And everybody else also lies and steals. And it's that everybody else which is crucial. The way Russian propaganda works is not to say that Russia is so great, right? Um, the way that Russia propaganda works is to say that, yes, you know, we're lousy, but everybody else is the same. And they're worse because they're hypocrites about it. They pretend that they have constitutions and democracies and laws. They pretend they have journalism, but that's all a lie. And that means that they're actually worse than we are. Because in addition to lying and stealing like we do, they also are hypocrites about lying and stealing, whereas we're not hypocrites. That's so, so Russian lying and stealing is better than everybody else's lying and stealing. If that's going to be your line, then you pursue a foreign policy which makes the European Union, European countries, the United States, Canada, look like that. And how do you do that? Well, you can, you can portray them in a negative way, 
Um, but what you can also do is you can make them be that way, which sounds incredibly ambitious, right? I mean, if I, were, if I, if I was saying this in 2012 or 2013, it would sound ridiculous. How is the Russian Federation going to make Western democracies look ridiculous? Uh, but in 2019, right, the answer shapes up without my even having to suggest it. It's not that hard, it turns out, by way of the internet, to find out what vulnerable points are and to press on them, which is, which is how all this works. If the domestic Russian politics of spectacle is based on television, the foreign policy is based on the internet. You're aware, of course, that at least half of the European electorate saw Russian propaganda on the internet before the elections yesterday, right? At least half is the current estimate, and these estimates only go up. So in the United States elections, I'm just going to throw out a couple numbers, 137 million people voted, 128 million people saw Russian propaganda before they voted, zero people were aware of this fact, right? So I'll talk more about this later, but I just want to give you a sense that it's much easier than it might seem. Or to put it a different way, um, and you should not interpret the following sentence as my discourage you from buying American military technology, which is of course the best in the world, etc. Um, but the entire Russian cyber budget, right? The entire Russian cyber budget. If you put, if you bring together military intelligence and FSB and the Internet Research Agency, you bring it all together. It's about as much as it costs to maintain one fighter plane, an American one. I mean, so and which would you rather have, right? Would you rather have one fighter plane or would you rather have the Russian cyber budget? Or which of those changed the world more in the last in the last few years, right? I wish the answer were different, but the answer is the Russian cyber budget has changed the world more. So this is the part of the conversation where people say, well, you know, really, like, did the Russians really affect the American elections? Did that really happen? And of course, the answer is yes. And the things that they did, they tested on you first. So let me, let me just give you an example. You remember when Russia invaded Ukraine? It's, um, I mean, it's, it's sometimes hard for Russians to remember, for Americans to remember and Europeans to remember when Russia invaded Ukraine, because during the time that Russia invaded Ukraine, which, by the way, by invasion, I mean a fairly straightforward definition of when your armed forces cross the border of another country and engage the armed forces of another country and take their territory. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, much of what Europeans were talking about and much of what Americans were talking about had nothing to do with what was going on. And that was because we had been targeted by a very sophisticated um, internet campaign, which was based upon our publicly available psychological susceptibilities. So in the first half of 2014, when Russia was invading its neighbor, the kind of thing that we used to notice, right? When Russia was invading its neighbor, what were we in the West very often talking about? Uh, if you were on the left, you were being told on Facebook, for example, um, ta-da, oh, that's Twitter, sorry, there's Facebook. Um, they use Twitter too. You were being told on Facebook, if you're on the left, that the Ukrainian government were a bunch of Nazis. Remember that? I know you do. Um, I mean, you know, the prime minister's Jewish, now the president's gonna be Jewish, but you know, whatever, they're all Nazis. Um, oh, which reminds me of the other story. If you're on the far right and you're on Facebook, Russia propaganda was telling you that the Ukrainian state was part of the international Jewish conspiracy. And people went for that too. And of course you can say, ha ha, that contradicts. But on the internet, no one ever talks to each other, so it doesn't matter, right? All your, what you, the way you use this kind of data is that you carve up the population into these clans, and then you target each clan with what it's going to be, wh with what it wants to hear, and then you give it to them more and more. And so, in early 2014, when one European country was invading another European country, Europeans were having an entirely irrelevant conversation about is Ukraine fascist or not? Or if you were on the right, it was is Ukraine entirely gay or not? Or is Ukraine entirely Jewish or not? Or is it, you know, is it gay Jewish fascist, right? That, and I'm not, I mean, here again, I wish I were exaggerating, but I'm not, right? No, one, it's, har it's hard to think of a case of one European country invading another European country which got so little attention, and there was a reason for that. But that's just my way of leading into how the Russians affected the American um, outcome. They almost certainly did. Um, there's a long argument about this in the book, but I'll just make a couple of points very, very quickly here. One of them is, has to do with email. So um, the, uh, a very important American Democratic Party um, advisor, John Podesta, his, his password for his Gmail account was password. 
don't do that, right? <laughs> um, that, that, that seems like a joke, right? Okay, I got you to smile. You haven't smiled the whole time, now I'm happy. Um, if your password is password, change that, because it was Podesta's emails which led to the Russian story that Hillary Clinton is uh, running a pedophile prostitution ring from a pizzeria basement in Washington, D.C., right? So part of it is the technique of stealing emails, and another part of it is fashioning those emails into a story. And of course, that story is ridiculous, except that politically it's not, since a third of the American population believed it in October of 2016. And the reason, by the way, that it was dropped in October 2016 was that it, it had to compete and push out the true story story that Mr. Trump is an advocate of the sexual abuse of women, right? So half an hour after that true story came out, the false story of Hillary Clinton selling sex with children came out, and the two basically canceled, right? So, so Trump's, this Trump sex abuse story had no resonance with the people who it might have had resonance with because they immediately were told, oh, Hillary had done something worse. Now that has to do with the digital world, it has to do with many things, but it also has to do with Russia. The whole, the whole six months between spring of 2016 and November 2016, including the presidential debates, were largely structured by email drops carried out by a foreign power, which was weird. And that's not even mentioning the, f the, the campaigns over Facebook and Twitter. I'll just give you one example of how those worked. There was um, Twitter, I'll pick on Twitter now. Um, there, was a, there was a Twitter account called 10 GOP, which was meant to be per the, the Twitter account of the Tennessee Republican Party. And this Twitter account spread stories like Barack Obama was born in Africa, Barack Obama is a Muslim, Hillary Clinton sells sex with children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The kinds of things which people who don't like democratic politicians would really like to hear, um, but the kinds of things that most Republican politicians would be too responsible to say, or at least were too responsible to say on an official Twitter account of their own political party. The result of this is that the, the, the Russian version of the Tennessee Republican Party has 10 times more followers than the actual Tennessee Republican Party. 10 times more followers. Now tell me that that doesn't make a difference when the major social media accounts um, of the foreign country are being followed by an order of magnitude more people than the actual social media accounts of the political party in, in question. And of course, the way that it works is the same way. It plays on susceptibilities. So I'll give you just one example that's true of 10 GOP and it's also true of a, a bunch of Facebook accounts. What the Russians did, just for example, was to say, if you are a racist, um, we're gonna tell you that Hillary Clinton loves black people. She loves black people. But if you are black, we're gonna tell you that Hillary Clinton is a racist. And in this way, try to suppress the African-American vote. Right? And again, those two things contradict, but it doesn't matter if they contradict. It's all about your particular susceptibilities and making you act on those susceptibilities. Now, the deep problem with all of this is that once people act on these susceptibilities in the real world, they have a hard time going back. This is the interesting thing about people. In fact, if you wanna know what's interesting about us, I'm beginning to think the best thing to do is to ask the bots because the, the bots, the digital beings, right, the algorithms are very good at finding the ways that we don't think. So one of them I've already mentioned, it's called confirmation bias. What you already think, you, you're likely to continue to think if you're affirmed, right? And so the algorithms are very good at finding the things you already think and massaging those things. Another problem that we have is called cognitive dissonance. So if I'm fooled into voting for Donald Trump because of something I see over the internet, my chan the chances are very strong that I will keep thinking up rationalizations for what I'm doing rather than say, oh, I was fooled and I made a mistake. And this has played out in, in the United States where it's very, very hard to find a single human being who says, hmm, well, 126 million Americans looked at Russian propaganda, but I wasn't one of them, right? No one will admit that they might have been influenced by something they saw on the internet. No one will admit that, right? That's cognitive dissonance, and that's a big problem. And by the way, it's, it, raises a, it raises another interesting question, I think, which is who actually, who actually won? So, I mean, one way of characterizing this is Putin won. Putin didn't like Hillary Clinton. He liked Donald Trump. So he won. 
Another way of characterizing this is saying Donald Trump won. He was running for president with, with the help of Russia, he won. Another way of characterizing this is that Russia won a cyber war, which I think is correct. Um, Russia engaged the United States in a cyber war in 2016 and won. And now we're dealing with the consequences, and so are you. Um, but there's another way of thinking about this, which goes a little bit deeper than the people and the countries, and it's the question of the digital and the human. And let me characterize it this way. A lot of the people who work for these companies um, didn't think they were supporting Donald Trump. Like, as human beings, they supported Hillary Clinton. In fact, in some cases, like the case of Eric Schmidt, they were openly supporting, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of part of Google, um, and they were openly supporting Hillary Clinton. But I think it's fair to say that much more of Silicon Valley, as human beings, were supporting Hillary Clinton than were supporting Donald Trump. And yet, their creations had the opposite effect. So. What does that mean, right? Who then is actually in charge? I'm just raising this. Or if there is going to be a politics of us and them in the 20th, 21st century, who is, who is the them? I've got my ideas of who the them is. It's, 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 the not, it's the not humans. Okay, Europe. This is where I'm gonna close. The thing about the politics of inevitability is that it's very easy to see the politics of inevitability when it's somebody else's politics of inevitability. So when I say the Americans think capitalism will lead to democracy, you know, you nod your head sagely and you think, oh yes, you know, those, those naive Americans, how could anyone think such a thing, right? But your politics of inevitability seems normal to you. That's the problem. And the, it, it only, it, it's only your politics of inevitability if it hurts a little bit when you start to, to see it. Um, so the, the, the politics inevitability that I'm gonna talk about now, it's not particularly Norwegian. If anything, you, you're at a little bit on the edge of it, but it's a European story. Um, and it's a European story which is leading you into the same kinds of problems that the Americans are having. Your politics of inevitability goes something like this. We Europeans have ancient national histories. And our ancient national histories have involved the creation of wonderful nation states, which only did good things. These nation states, unfortunately, were involved in a couple of world wars in the 20th century. These world wars only concerned Europe, even though they're called world wars. And at the end of these two world wars, we Europeans realized that war was bad. And we decided, unlike the Americans who kept fighting wars, we decided that we would create political cooperation on the basis of economic cooperation, hence the European Union or, um, the, or, or EFTA or whatever it might be. Um, this is the story. You can correct me in Q&A if you think that's not the story, but I think that's basically the story. In any event, I hear it from children educated in, in the European Union and have done so for the last 25 years when I, when I try to teach them. The thing about this story is that it's just not true. <laughs> It's simply not true. Right? Your nations are generally not very old. Nation states are very exceptional in European history. And when they exist, they generally don't last for a very long time. The mainstream of European history is empire. Um, and the story of the 20th century has very little to do with nation states. It has to do with European empires finding a way to preserve prosperity despite losing empire, despite having a second world war by way of economic cooperation. In other words, the economic cooperation part doesn't really have anything to do with nation states growing wise. The economic cooperation part has to do with empires losing their domains. So you have to, to see this, you have to recharacterize the second world war. The second world war is a German colonial war for Ukraine. And as soon as you see it that way, then you see the German defeat in the Second World War as one in a series of European defeats, right? Where the Dutch then lose in 1949, the French are going to lose by 1962, the Belgians have to give up in 1960, the Italians also lose in the Second World War. And now I've named all of the founding members of the European project except for Luxembourg, and I give you Luxembourg. <laughs> if, you then, if you then think of the, the countries that join the European project after that, Great Britain in the 1960s, Portugal and Spain after democratic transitions in the 1970s. These were also all maritime empires that were aware that in losing their maritime empires, they needed a substitute. They were aware of it at the time, right? Then once the European project becomes big, then you know places that are more like nation states, although not entirely nation states, are drawn towards it. 
That's what actually happens. But because Europeans have their own politics of inevitability about the nation state and how it learns and so on, you are vulnerable in your domestic politics um, because it's not clear just how much the state owes to Europe or what European states would be like if there weren't Europe. Uh, the British, God forbid, may be about to find out, but if they do find out, I'm afraid it's not going to be the British who find out because there won't be any Britain left over very quickly after, after Brexit, which, as I say, I hope doesn't happen. But it also makes you vulnerable, right? So the way that digital propaganda works is by way of finding vulnerabilities. And if you follow Russian digital propaganda inside Europe, it's interesting how it always hits at exactly the same weak point. It, it, it always makes the same argument. The argument is you shouldn't have Europe because Europe allows the gays, the gypsies, the Jewish international conspiracy, whatever it is, that Europe allows some alien force to control you. The only way to be safe and secure is to go back to the nation state. And this is what they say to everybody, right? They say it in Norway, they say it in the Czech Republic, they say it in Poland. It's the same message. And the reason why it's the same message is because they know that this is your vulnerability. Because this thing I've said about empire, like it takes a while to kind of wind it up and explain it to Europeans sometimes, but from the outside, it's totally obvious, right? I mean, from Russia or from Ukraine, it's completely obvious that the purpose of the European Union is imperial management that they what the European Union is for is to take flawed fragments of empire and to help them become functional states. If you're in Ukraine, you see that and you think it's a good idea. If you're in Russia, you see that and you're trying to stop it. But from outside the European Union, it's perfectly obvious this is what it's all about. Hence, the Russians always aim for your weak spot, which is um, the belief that at some point there were these nation states. And since they existed at some point, why not just pull them out of the European Union? So this is the point on which I'm, I'm, I'm going to close, which is an, an optimistic point. <laughs> so this is a history book. Um, it's a very conservative history book in lots of ways. It uses primary sources, it moves forward in time, it's chronological, it makes, a, it makes one very careful argument. Um, and it, it's, it's not just a history book, it's actually a kind of plea for history. Because my little idea about all of us, but about the Europeans in particular, is that history is actually empowering. So that, there, that history is actually a form of the politics of time and that it may be an empowering form. I used to think that history was in some, some way out of politics and I could be a historian sometimes and an intellectual other times. I no longer believe that and here's why. The things that history is based on, factuality, um, the possibility of multiple perspectives, chronological time that moves forward, those things are all now politically contested. If <coughs> politics is about time, the dominant form of politics, the thing I'm calling the politics of eternity, contests all of those premises of my profession. It contests that facts are real, it contests that multiple perspectives are possible, and it contests that time moves forward. So history then has to be a form of political thought. And if it has to be a form of political thought, I want to suggest that it might actually have fruitful outcomes. So just consider the point that I, I, I just made about Europe and, and, and empire. Imagine, just for the point sake of argument, that that's the correct interpretation of history. What would that suggest for the future? Well, it would suggest for the future that Europeans have a lot more power than they think they do. Because after all, if Europeans have managed the transition from empire to something else, they are the only people who have done so. And if you've managed the transition from empire to something else while creating the largest economy in the history of the world, and yes, I'm going to include Norway and Switzerland for the sake of argument here, um, but even if I don't, it's still the largest economy in the history of the world. If you've succeeded in creating a zone of contiguous welfare states, you've actually done something which much of the rest of the world has reason to envy, but I would go further than that. Think about it this way. When you're here, right, if you're in Oslo or Berlin, Vienna, uh, even Warsaw, you're no longer in an imperial world or there are brackets around you. <laughs> if you're outside, even if you're in America, and I realize I'm speaking from a very privileged American position here about these things, but from outside, it's still an imperial world. <laughs> whether the empire is Chinese or Russian or American or whether it's Facebook, 
Facebook or Google or Amazon, it's still an imperial world. It's a world which is characterized by legal non-recognition and radical inequality and I invisible forms of power, right? In the EU, much less so. So if people in Europe characterize themselves as a bunch of small and medium-sized nation states who decided because they're, they're such nice people that economic cooperation might be a good thing, then you're not responsible, right? But if you characterize yourselves as having found a solution to imperial problems, then you're responsible. And the little things that you're doing, like for example, the level of the nation state, or level of the state, I should say, uh, policies about digital monopoly, or at the level of political parties, the emergence of the Greens, or at the level of the European Union, digital privacy and anti-monopoly policies, those things then start to look like something else. They start to look like a kind of coherent approach towards the future, which by the way, nobody else has. So the little argument here at the end is that if you see yourself historically, instead of in terms of the politics of inevitability, we have to, be, we have, to have Europe because we're so nice and so on, or the politics of eternity, we have to reject Europe because it's letting those foreigners in. If you see it historically, you know, that you're not innocent, that you're powerful, that you have responsibility, then you actually can not only make the future, but you can see yourselves making the future, at least more than the rest of us can. That's as optimistic as I get, thank you. Thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. I think we all enjoyed that thoroughly. Having read The Road to Run Freedom, I, I would like to start off by saying that I do like the style, uh, mixing journalism with principled discussions and sticking to overall argument makes it uh, a thrilling read in many ways. Thank you. And of course, uh, from a Norwegian point of view, uh, the first question must be that I read somewhere that you started or came up with the idea for this book on the plane to Sweden. So what book did you start on the way to Norway? <laughs> okay, well, as a, as a very boring conservative historian, I have to correct factually. What I was, I was in Sweden, um, I, was, I was in Sweden the night of the American presidential elections of, of November 2016. And of course, I felt very guilty <laughs> for being in Sweden at the time, um, but, it, but it was on the way back from that that I started to write on tyranny because I started to think on the plane back from, from, from Stockholm, I was thinking, okay, what are Americans gonna say? Americans are gonna say, uh, Americans are gonna say this doesn't really matter and the institutions are gonna protect us. And of course, as a historian of Central and Eastern Europe and of the Holocaust um, and of the Soviet Union, I, I, I'm unsympathetic to that point of view. I think the institutions only help you if you help the institutions. And so on, the, on one of those little napkins that you get in the airplane, I started writing down a list of things and that was on tyranny. So, so I, it's a boring correction, but it was on the way back from Sweden and I haven't, I haven't actually left. That's, 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 right. just, that's just worse. You're, yeah, not, you're so not helping yourself yeah, there. So, yeah, so after having been to Sweden, yeah. you came up with the idea for the, yeah. Yeah, no, no, but, but the thing, <laughs> but I haven't left Oslo yet is my point, so. <laughs> Well, <coughs> we, will, we will ask you again next time you visit uh, our fair, fair land. There we go. Um, uh, here's a point that, uh, that uh, might uh, sort of dovetail with some of the points that, uh, that you made in your discussion. Uh, you've introduced in past talks a term called schizofascism. What mm. is schizofascism? So, uh, let, me, let me take a step back from that. I'm, I'm trying to find ways to say that bits and pieces of the fascist heritage are very much actuel in contemporary political life without saying that a particular regime is fascist because I don't think Russia is fascist. And I, don't think the, I don't think the United States is fascist. But I think it's significant that the fascist heritage is coming back in the, in, at the level of rhetoric, right? If you think of, like, think of Mr. Trump's top three uh, political or, or top three dis discursive devices, lock her up, drain the swamp, and build that wall, right? Those things and the way he used them in public were, I think, unmistakably 
fascist. And then you have, you know, in, in Russia, you have uh, the, the revival of people who were fascists, um, Ivan Ilin, for example. And you also have people who are unmistakably fascist, like Alexander Dugin and Alexander Kohanov, playing visible public roles, let's put it in that modest way. How do we characterize that? And I've been trying to find ways to talk about it. So one of, the, one of the things I've been saying recently is that it's a kind of passive aggressive fascism where the fascists you know, were at least aggressive. Like they, had, they, had a ver they wanted to destroy and create something else and they were clear about that. Whereas the people on the far right now, um, whether it's Mr. Trump in my country or the right wing populists in Europe, they're against the status quo, but they don't actually say what they're gonna do about it. And you know they're they're in favor of d of weakening things and discrediting things and undermining things, but it's all this passive aggression, right? Like what they don't have a sense of what they would put in its place. I mean, think about the way the far right is treating the European Union. Well, we don't like it at all, and that's why we want to be elected to it because then we can stand up and complain about it, right? I mean, that's a slight overstatement, but not much, right? So th there's a kind of passive aggressive fascism what we see in the West. Schizofascism is a particularly Russian thing because schizofascism is when a fascist calls you a fascist. That's schizofascist. Assuming you're not a fascist, right? I'm just going to assume that. If a fascist calls you a fascist, that's what I mean by schizofascism. And that's very widespread in Russia because in Russia, especially since the 1970s, the word fascist, as you all know, basically means someone who's attacking Russia from the outside. And so by definition, it's basically, it's a semantic failure if you, if you say a Russian is a fascist. A Russian can't be a fascist because Russia is the victim of fascism. And so you have people like Alexander Dugin, for example, or Alexander Pohanov, who call other people fascists, you know, you usually are not, right? Like if they call Obama a fascist, I mean, say what you want about Obama, um, but you know, those guys are actual fascists. That's what I mean by schizofascism, is when a fascist calls somebody else a fascist. And it's, it, it fits into this whole larger passive aggressive idea because it's not just that they're calling you a name, it's also that they're confusing the whole notion of what fascism is, right? When a fascist calls somebody else a fascist, it undermines the sense of the word fascism. It makes it even harder to talk about fascism. You, you put forth um, the argument that we also encounter in the book, which of course in the book is much more detailed and nuanced and meticulous. Uh, let me put forth the counter argument. Um, Hillary Clinton had 10 times the, uh, the money, she had all the, me the media outlets. Isn't it possible that she lost because she was a rotten candidate? You know, like reading the book mm -hmm. Shattered, it, it really reads like an unfunny unfun version of Veep. Uh, isn't it possible that the Democrats put forth a candidate that was bound to lose and that we don't need any Russians in this story? So let me, let me first, like, let me first sharpen your question, <laughs> and then, and then, no, because I, I mean you have a, you have a point. Let me first like push it as far as I can, and then try to respond. Because you go. It, so when I talk about the politics of inevitability, I'm I'm talking also about the American Democratic Party, right? I mean, the, the, I came up w when Mr. Trump won. My my students came to me because I have a job. I teach. <laughs> my my students came to me, and they they said, "Can you help us explain what's just happened?" And that was poignant, right, and kind of sad because, like, they were, they, they were, they are creations of what I call the politics of inevitability. I mean, base, you know, they've had eight years of Obama, which in many ways is wonderful. Eight years of Obama, um, although a lot of bad things were happening underneath, right, which made which made Trump possible. But I mean, as one of them put it to me, as one of the smartest of my students put it to me, we thought the only thing that could go wrong was global warming. That's it. So we're unprepared for this. And so I came up with the politics inevitability to describe basically the American Democratic Party, um, to describe Barack Obama, to describe Hillary Clinton. It wasn't, I was trying to find a way to explain how people we might find sympathetic or take for granted might be making some deep intellectual mistakes which are preparing the way for, for problems. The American Democratic Party has, had become uh, an over-centralized party, which was concerned with basically, um, you know, celebrity clan leadership, and and they had lost they'd lost two thirds of the states, right? The, the Democrats in America, as you may know, are actually a majority party. You might not recognize that from the outcomes, but they are a majority party. They actually have an absolute majority. Um, they just can't win, <laughs> which is your point. But they they managed to lose control of um, 
of, of about two thirds of the states. And America is actually a federal system where, for example, election law is decided at the state level. So when you lose control of the states, that makes it very hard to win. Because in 22 of those American states in the last six years, new voter suppression laws have been passed, which make it harder for Democrats to win. Right, so <clears throat> I'm just trying to push this critique as you know further. Right, so the Democrats have made lots of mistakes. I'm going to give that to you, and I also think the Democrats probably had other candidates who would be who would be more like who would have been more likely to win. And while we're talking about the Democrats, like here's something which I find really interesting this time around. Um, it may not be visible from a distance, but I find this kind of fascinating. There's like there's a gender politics element of this book which we probably won't get to, but. One of, the, one of the things that is interesting about the Democrats now is that all the boys are like doing backslapping and all the girls actually have a plan, <laughs> right? <laughs> like Elizabeth Warren actually has a plan or she has a number of plans. Kamala Harris actually has a number of plans. Whereas with the guys, it's a little bit harder. It's like, it's all emotional. And so like in a weird way, the gender stereotypes have flipped and, and it's somehow that's all okay. Right, like it's all okay for like it's all okay for boys to cry. In fact, that's all they're supposed to do at this point. I think is to cry. Um, whereas the women like have to come up with plans, and even when they do, they lose. Which is where my defense of Hillary Clinton begins. Yes, she might not have been a good candidate, but it's important to remember that the stakes were really high. If Hillary Clinton had won, the United States would look very different right now in a whole lot of ways, and it wouldn't seem so strange. I mean, it would probably seem a lot less strange from Europe, and it was only 70,000 votes, and it was spread out over a few states. But I take your point, and, and I, and, but history, of course, involves multiple things happening at the same time. It's, it's, a, it's a mistake to say one thing causes other things. I think the, the, the reasons that the Democrats lost um, had to do with how they ran the campaign. I think it had to do a bit with this politics of inevitability where they were a little bit distant from the real problems of some of their core constituents. But <clears throat> I don't think Mr. Trump could have won without Russian help. I, I, I think, you know, you say that, that, that Secretary Clinton wasn't the best candidate, but Mr. Trump wasn't exactly perfect either. I mean, he... <laughs> He had, I mean, he has some real talent. You know, he is actually a good speaker in a kind of technical sense, like he, or he knows how to play an audience. Uh, but he wasn't the best candidate either. And, and people did notice this at the time, right? I mean, if anything, people were too dismissive of him as a candidate. But I just want to say, like, it's not as though he, he and his campaign were some kind of technical masterpiece. They weren't. They weren't even aware that there was a massive Russian bot campaign on their behalf, right? Like it was an interesting division of labor where Trump showed up in person and the Russians, but also some other entities were running internet backup for him, which you know he didn't have to know about, but it was, but it was definitely there. So to take the example that I mentioned, when in October of 2016, it was revealed that Mr. Trump um, thought that it was all right to sexually assault women, basically everybody thought he was gone. I mean, even Mike Pence, who is not a man of like, particularly high moral character. Even Mike Pence said, okay, Mr. Trump, I'm not gonna talk to you for 24 hours. <laughs> I'm gonna see how this all sorts itself out, which was, I, th I think that was meant to be a, you know, a principled stand. <laughs> uh, but everyone thought that the Trump was over. If you don't believe me, just go back and look at the news like on that day. But the thing is the news of that day didn't include the thing which I mentioned in the talk, which is that right when Mr. Trump, w right when this was revealed, 30 minutes afterwards, the Hillary Clinton story about the pizza parlor was dumped, right? 30 minutes afterwards as a reaction to it. I don't think Mr. Trump would have survived even without, I mean, without that one little thing. And that's not the only thing that was done on his behalf. So I'm willing to accept that there are a bunch of variables, but I think without, Mr. without the help of the Russians, Mr. Trump wouldn't have gotten over the top. By the way, just to plug somebody else's book, there's an American political scientist who's probably the leading scholar of political communications in the US called Kathleen Hall Jameson. And she's written a book which is, um, which is very technical but very interesting and convincing in which she argues that the Russian intervention made the difference. And she's using all kinds of methodologies which I wouldn't even begin to think about. So if this is something you wanna follow up, um, Kathleen Hall Jameson, the book's called Cyber War. Yep. All right, uh, but just you know, uh, s s since we're sparring on this, uh, you say that it's the the pizza parlor thing. What would you say to those people who argue that uh, there's a book on it? No, there's a movie on Netflix called Primary Colors, John Travolta starring as uh, as Bill Clinton, detailing 
uh, the escapades, uh, sexual escapades of Bill Clinton, and wasn't the get out of free card that uh, Trump needed the history of the Clintons when it came to exactly the same sort of behavior on behalf of the past president? Why do you why do you latch on to the to the pizza parlor over the press conference that Trump kept with? women who said they had been sexually abused by Bill Clinton and that Hillary Clinton had done nothing to support mm -hmm. them. Uh, because to my mind, that, that might be more persuasive to many people than the pizza parlor. So uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that the pizza parlor was stunningly persuasive. Um, the, one of the sources of, of on tyranny um, was m my, in October 2016, going and talking to people which was very useful um, because I, I had, I was following the campaign from my particular perspective as someone who works on Russia and Ukraine, and as someone who has some interest in digital politics. And the striking thing about the American presidential campaign in 2016 was how familiar it was that you know these these techniques. Like I made this Ukrainian American comparison, but that was apparent to me at the time because I'd paid a lot of attention to what Russia was doing in Ukraine. And the really striking thing with America was that they were doing the same stuff, but that nobody was aware of it, right? That nobody was skeptical about it. I mean, literally zero people were saying the Russians are involved and this might make a difference. So when I say that the pizza campaign, the pizza parlor thing mattered, I'm reporting to you um, not just opinion polls, which say that 32% of Americans believe that I think, I'm reporting to you the conversations I had on people's doorsteps in October of 2016. There were a lot of people out there who thought that Hillary Clinton was a mass murderer. Um, that is a phrase which I heard over and over and over again, mass murderer. She is a mass murderer, right? Um, which, you know, like, okay, can I have some tea? You know, like, let's, <laughs> maybe, we could, maybe we could develop this. Um, and I mean, and, 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 and there's, there's something also which is uh, intangible. If you believe that Hillary Clinton was a mass murderer, or if you believe, like I say enough times, you're gonna start believing it, right? Because that's the way that it works. I just repeat it over and over and over again. And then tomorrow morning you'll be saying, hmm, I heard that Hillary Clinton was a mass murderer. Let me tweet about that. Um, yeah, it's not a joke. The hashtag is killery. That's the, that was the Russian hashtag. So all the major Russian, so the, th the one that I mentioned, 10 GOP and a bunch of other Russian sites, they use the hashtag killery, right? That was one of the ways that they spread this. Um, but the intangible thing, and and I can't, you know, I can't prove this, but it's what I find interesting. I've been knocking on people's doors and talking to them about who they should vote for in American elections my whole adult life. But I had never had the feeling before 2016 that people didn't want to talk to me because they wanted to get back to their computers, which were telling them the stuff they wanted to hear, right? Like I'd never had the experience where people said, if they, they said like, come on, come look at this, like, look at this. You don't believe she's a mass murderer? Come look at this thing, right? That for me, that for me was new, and it's why, like, it's why personally, I'm, I, I tend to think that it actually was the internet fiction, which gave people the sense that, like, there was something wrong about Hillary. I, I, I think, you know, if if it was the real world, and we don't like Mr. Clinton for his sexual behavior, then we should also not like Mr. Trump for his sexual behavior. But that's that's not how it worked. Cool. Uh, just keeping on, you know, like uh, uh, prodding, it, prodding and pushing you. Just as so long as it's not about sex. <laughs> 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 okay. um, Americans uh, got, uh, got very, very exasperated <coughs> when somebody tried to influence your elections, but when you look uh, at Tim Weiner's book, you know, A Legacy of Ashes, A History of the CIA, it seems that America has been playing that game <laughs> all over the world and right. also in democracies for a long, long time. Uh, sour grapes? Well, does that does that make it good? No, <laughs> certainly not. Okay, I mean that's that's my point. I mean, if you think democracy is good, then you think democracy is good. If you think foreign intervention democracy is bad, then you think it's bad. The argument that you know that that I killed your sister doesn't make it okay for you to kill my sister, right? It's I mean morally, I just don't get this argument. Um, but yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, is it it's it's only uh, it's only fun as long as we we, we do it, right? But I never said it was fun. No, no. I said it was wrong. Yeah, because the, the, this, you know, like, you, are you running the danger of sort of pre, uh, pre, pre assuming some sort of age of innocence before Russia's entry? Because I completely buy into the, uh, your mm. arguments about Russian influence of the American uh, election. I think that's, that's above um, uh, dispute. But 
American elections were never re <laughs> were, yeah. were not very nice before that with the super PACs. Amazing amounts of, mon uh, of money yeah. is being spent on American presidential campaigns to influence right. them. Uh, why did the Russians succeed where so mu much right. money was spent to subvert the election in, the yeah. I, uh, in other ways? Yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's a great question. And I, I try to bring these two things together because I don't, I, I certainly don't want to say, and by the way, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, I don't say <laughs> that American democracy was in perfect condition before the Russians came along and messed it up. What I do, what I, what I in fact say is that American democracy, as you quite rightly suggest, had a number of serious structural problems. Um, in addition to the money in politics, there is also the electoral college and gerrymandering, um, and I mean, and voter suppression laws, which are not you know history, which are un and unfortunately they are contemporary in the United States. We are suppressing more votes now than we did five years ago. So I quite agree. The way that I think about this is that many of our weaknesses are what the Russians saw and used. So if you under you know the electoral college system, another one of our problems which means that you can win the general election, let's say by three million votes and still not be president, right? So for all of our criticism of Hillary Clinton, let's remember she did get three million more votes than the other guy, um, which you know would normally be a substantial majority. Uh, it, the, the Russians in the last couple of weeks of the election are targeting Wisconsin and Michigan, which are crucial states for the electoral college. And they are targeting Wisconsin and Michigan using a data available from Facebook about people who fear Muslims or people who fear African Americans, right? They're using the weaknesses that are there. So the way that I try to argue it in the last chapter of the book is that we should think of the Russian assault not as a kind of violation of our innocence, which would be ludicrous, but rather as a kind of diagnostic, right? that this is another way to see what our own problems actually are. I mean, pushing it even further, racism, right? I mean, why did, why, wh wh they, they're not just taking advantage of our technical problems with democracy, they're taking advantage of our own problems with inequality in a number of ways. When they suppress the black vote, they can only do that because black people actually do have some reasons to be suspicious. Or when they encourage racists to vote, they can only do that because the racists are there in the first place. So, I mean, I, I'm, a believer, I'm a big believer in, in history as a source of self-correction. That you, you, If you look hard at what actually happens, it's not that we can stop the Russians. I mean, there's some things that we could do if Mr. Trump weren't president. There's some things that we could do to stop them from doing this again. Um, but most of the things we have to do are actually purely domestic, and you can see the Russians as reminding us of that. And I, you know, I, 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 I quite agree about the money in politics. It's totally ridiculous. Um, before we move on to question and answers, you, you, you caught some flack by some colleagues arg who argues Marlene Arvel, I don't know her, uh, who argues that you dig too deep. Uh, oh. To find to find that's the sources. That's that's a nice that's a nice criticism. I like <laughs> that. <laughs> to find the sources of uh -huh. uh, of contemporary Russian uh, yeah. I identity, for the lack of a better word, or speaking English yeah. well enough, Lev Gumilev, Ivan Ilin, uh, Alexander Dugin. Are there any signs that Putin is uh, an intellectual? Does he read? I don't think he does. Oh no! Yeah, well, okay. H I'm not that. Should I say this in public? Sure. We're, we're he does read. <laughs> um, so do you call him Vladimir or Vlad when no, no, you hang out? I'm in, a position, I'm in a position to know that he does read and that he does read Eileen. Um, th that, that actually happened to know on pretty good authority that he does read Eileen. But even, so Ivan Eileen was an early 20th century Russian philosopher, a very, I mean, a very interesting philosopher. I spent a lot of time in chapter one talking about him, which is, what um, the colleague is criticizing me for. And by the way, like that was, if I was just being tactical, I would never have done that. You know, I've written, I've written if I was just trying to like reach people, I wouldn't have written 40 pages about this obscure Russian philosopher that no one has ever heard of. And if I was just trying to like be plausible, I wouldn't have spent months and months and months reading the 40 books of his work, which are in Russian and German, um, to try to figure him out. But the, re I, the reason I did that what, well, there are two reasons. The first is that Mr. Putin did cite him. He stopped now, by the way. But Mr. Putin did cite him over and over and over again, right? I mean, it's true that like if you Google plus Putin plus Elin, I think you only get five 
as some colleagues have mentioned, but if you actually read Mr. Putin's speeches and take it seriously, there are many, many more references to Eileen or to his ideas in, in, from, by Mr. Putin over a period of about 10 years. So, and, and also, I mean, look, let's just imagine the following scenario. Imagine that the president or the prime minister of a country cites a fascist philosopher in public multiple times, including at his annual address. Would you pay attention to that? Would that seem significant to you, right? To me, like, presumptively, that is significant. What would you say if a prime minister of a country found the, those, the papers of that fascist in a faraway library and personally saw to it that those papers came back to Russia? What would you say if a prime minister of a country personally saw to it that the physical remains of this fascist philosopher were dug up and brought back to Russia? And then there was a big ceremony around it. And what would you say if that prime minister and then later president uh, regularly brought flowers to that grave? I think you would say something is going on here, right? I mean, try to think of another example anywhere in the Western world of any kind of political thinker, fascist or not, who's received that kind of treatment the papers, the reburial, the multiple citations by head of government and state. I don't think there are any. And I think our, what we do is the politics of inevitability. We say, oh, like the ideology, it's not that important. You know, ideas don't really matter. Mr. Putin's really a pragmatist. He just cares about money. And since just caring about money makes you a capitalist, then everything's basically gonna turn out to be okay. He's just motivated like the rest of us, you know. But I think it's different. I mean, we're never gonna find out, but I have a feeling that when you have $40 billion, or euros, um, I'm just gonna let that like sink in. Imagine you have 40 billion euros. If you had 40 billion euros, you would probably start to think of reasons why this had to be the case. So I, one doesn't have to choose between like, is, is he a pragmatist or is he an ideologist? I think the ideas matter to him because he needs a way to explain the way the world is and why it has to be the way it is. But I mean, this is an idea for which I'm willing to take risks. It's a lot easier to say, you know, it's all pragmatic because then everybody in the West will say, oh yes, it's all, it's all pragmatic. It's a lot riskier to say, actually ideas matter, but I, do, mm. I think ideas do matter. Thank you very much for a very stimulating <laughs> conversation. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes where I will, uh, as I promised, involve the audience. Uh, you will be allowed it to ask questions. You will be provided with a microphone. Uh, we can start here in front. Um, Katrina? Uh, thank you for uh, this intellectual exercise. I'm <laughs> Catherine, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oslo. So my question is whether history is always cyclical and how it's used by far-right autocrats in contemporary Europe. Because it's really the future absent. And I'm asking that because, yes, we see how political actors are creatively using history in centuries and in, you know, making boundaries between virtuous insiders and pure insiders and dangerous others. But they also actually have quite clear visions for the future. Mm -hmm. So I've been working, for instance, in the Hungarian case, and yeah. although I think your theoretical framework really works well for the Russian case, uh, in Hungary, the movement I worked with, the Jobbik Movement for a Better Future, so I did mm -hmm. ethnogra ethnographic fieldwork with them, mm -hmm. and they really have clear visions for the future. They even call themselves a movement for a better future. And yes, they have visions based on nostalgia for the past, but there's also a clear policy program. Thank you. But what, what, sorry, okay. what, what, what is the vision for the future that they have? The vision for the future is going to be obviously illiberal Europe. So it's a very neo-nationalist, illiberal version of a future for Europe, but it's still a vision. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the urban vision. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, 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 I take your point. I mean, I think the, the big exception to what I'm saying is China. I think China has, China does have a kind of vision of the future. What I'm struck by though, um, is how these understandings of the future, when they exist at all, are so totally uncreative, <laughs> right? That seems to me to be a difference. If the idea of, if your idea of, you t of, of the future is something like, and I think it is in the case of Jobbik, but you'll know better than me, a kind of sanitized version of the interwar period where you forget what went wrong and why it went wrong, um, and you kind of project a kind of abstract authoritarianism to the future, I'm not sure that really counts as a vision of the future. I mean, it is a notion of what's gonna come next, but I'm not sure it rises to the level of the sort of thing that we used to have, 
um, especially on the extremes of politics. It doesn't strike me as that creative. I mean, I, I, t I take your point, and, it, and what you say would be true of Poland too. Peace definitely has an idea of the future. It's just a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of bland, repetitive vision of the future. Or I guess the way that I might ask the question again is, like, do any of these people, including Putin, um, have an idea of the future which doesn't sound like somebody could have written it in 1925? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I would like to also ask you a question. You write in the beginning of your book, um, The Road to Unfreedom, because you just touched upon China here. Mm -hmm. You write that for the kleptocratic regime in Moscow, of course, China, they know that China is the big challenge in the future. Mm -hmm. But if they are going to compete or even make it visible to the Russian people that China is the real challenger, yeah. uh, they will you know, lose also in the eyes of their own people. Uh, so that's why they pick on the West, because they know that the West is not a challenge. It's China who is challenging them. Could you say a little bit more on your argument on that uh, point? While mm -hmm. China is definitely someone who has a different view on where the future is going. And then we have one lady here. Yeah, okay. Maybe I'll just, okay. I can take it, maybe I'll just answer both at once. Mm -hmm. um, hello. First of all, thank you so much for an incredible speech. And uh, I spent last summer reading On Tyranny as well as Road to Unfreedom. And I, especially on Tyranny, that was a great book to recommend to friends that don't normally read <laughs> uh, and wake them up a little bit to what's Thanks. happening. Um, my question really is about the youth and curriculums and what we need to do to really prepare this new generation to be able to detect these um, s these kind of, not just lies, but you know, these are c attacks to the state <laughs> yeah. as well as the ideas that we hold very near and dear. Um, a friend of mine who was a Bernie supporter was actually using the killery um, hashtag. Oh so I just feel like uh, if you could speak a little bit more on what you think needs to be done with curriculums in schools and how we can prepare the new generation to overcome these, uh, <laughs> these attacks. Okay. okay. So, so first, on, first on China and um, then on hashtag killery. Um, so I'm I'm not a, I'm not a China specialist. I mean, the, the one of the ways that uh, that Road to Unfreedom is a very conservative book is that I'm using languages that I know. You know, it's if you read the book, you know, from the footnotes, which you know, those of you who are co fellow colleagues will. Have, I mean, the way that academics read books, by the way, is that we we, we first read the acknowledgments <laughs> to figure out like who's still sleeping with who, and then and then <laughs> and then we read the footnotes to see you know because if you, you you know like if you read the footnotes you know what the prose is going to say so you just read the footnotes um but uh but so i'm not a i'm not i don't i, I don't read mandarin i don't read kennedy's i'm not a china specialist so what i say about china in the book is very much in the background and you've mm -hmm. already you've already summarized it very nicely i think that part of the russian dilemma is that they don't know what to do about china I mean, their conventional military forces are 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 pretty impressive, and they spend they, they spend you know as experts will know they spend a lot of time training, moving conventional military forces back and forth across the enormous part of of, of Eurasia that Russia controls. They're, they're kind of doing what they can on that front, but in the long in the long in the long run, China actually is a problem. I mean, not just demographically, but in terms of the Chinese need for energy and the Chinese need for fresh water and the Chinese need for arable soil. If you're Russia, those are things that's, which understandably make you nervous. There's, and from, I, from, for, for me, as an American, there, just, there seems to be a lot of displacement. Like, the, one of the commanders of Russian forces in Ukraine was talking about how we had to invade Ukraine to make sure that the Americans don't get our water supplies. And I was thinking, okay, I mean, that's kind of an indirect way to do it, but <laughs> it's not really, I mean, somebody's, thinking about your water supplies, but it's not us. I mean, we're <laughs> actually kind of far away from you. Um, but I, I, think, I think there is a kind of psychological displacement going on where, and, and it makes a certain sort of political sense, if there's a problem you can't deal with, mm. it's best not to talk about mm. it. The funny thing about the, about the European Union and, and North America is that we don't constitute a problem for Russia in any traditional sense, um, only in a kind of abstract ideological sense. And you, and you know that you can pick on us and we won't really do very much back. I mean, I think actually the EU did more back than they expected. But you know, you can't, you can't pick on China in the same way. I mean, just try it and see what, and see what happens. Mm. So I think, I think it, the whole thing is kind of a, I mean, I, I, to call it the death throes of Russian sovereignty might be going too far, but there is a weird way in which the Russian political class has chosen to focus 
on the West mm -hmm. as a kind of enemy of preference rather than worry about becoming a Chinese mm -hmm. satellite, which may just be too frightening. But I have to leave that to people who know better than me. On this question, it's a one it's a wonder it's a wonderful question. I mean the whole I mean the whole trajectory into on tyranny and road to unfreedom starts with my thinking about about my students and um and what it, what it is that you know my generation did wrong or what it was you know why the end of history was such a bad idea you know why why going for 30 years you know on cruise control do european cars have cruise control mm -hmm. <laughs> no yes okay um why going for, for 30 years on cruise control was a bad idea um and i mean i, I have three answers to your question the the first is that and this is not just true of America, it's true of Europe too. We need to have civics classes. I mean, Europeans don't know how the European Union works. I mean, I, I'm sure all of you do, even though you're in Norway, but thank you for the earnest nod. But many, <laughs> many, many Europeans just don't actually know how the European Union works, many right? Europe many people working for the European Union don't <laughs> know how the European <laughs> Union works. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a higher level of, <laughs> it's a higher level of ignorance though. Um, but, uh, and I won't go into how the European Union works, but like, I mean, you know, like, if you ask Europeans how many bu how many bureaucrats there are in Brussels, you know, people would get it massively wrong because the answer and the answer is actually not very many, like less than in an average European capital. Um, and in the U.S., I mean, one, I mean, it's it's it goes back to your question actually about like why the Democrats lost. Part of the problem is that I I that you know Americans have, are, are worse and worse at understanding how the government's supposed to work, and therefore the category leader, which is a category I really don't like. I mean, partly because I'm a historian of Germany, but the category leader <laughs> looms larger and larger each presidential election, and mm -hmm. the category president, right, is smaller and smaller. And like the the notion of what executive power is supposed to be. So to give a, you know a trivial example, we're talking about not talking about fighting a war with Iran, which constitutionally we're not supposed to fight wars without the approval of Congress. The last time we did that was um, it was 1941, right? But you know the the, cur the current discussion just kind of whisks that away, like oh, of course, you know, Mr. Trump can start a war whenever he wants because Congress passed an unbinding resolution about Iraq 18 years ago, right? You know, we we we're, we're very f and and you can get away with that because nobody's nobody pays attention to how the Constitution works. So, civics is answer number one. Answer number two is um, very conservative, very conservative journalism. <laughs> Right? I mean, the, the only people who are saving us now are the investigative journalists. If we didn't have the investigative journalists, we wouldn't know, I mean, Mr. Trump would have far fewer problems. Mr. Putin would have far fewer problems. We wouldn't even know about the Russian invasion of Ukraine because it was covered by a few dozen people, mm -hmm. right? There are a whole, like the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, you take a few thousand journalists off the planet and suddenly like things are much, much, much worse than they are. So mm -hmm. very conservative education in investigative journalism. Everybody has a year of journalism class where they have to go report an actual story without looking at the goddamn internet a single time, right? Where they have to go and talk to people, where they have to travel and they have to report. I think that would be a good exercise. And then, um, what was the third thing? Um, Oh, history. <laughs> um, uh, oh. <laughs> history. I mean, I think it's a. I think it's a big. It's a big problem that neither the U.S. nor nor Europe has a common base of historical knowledge. And I mean, in Europe, you know, Monet said, you know, if I could do it again, I would, you know, je commencerai avec la culture. I would be, if I could do it again, I'd begin with culture. And there's a point there, right? One of the reasons that Europe is bumping up against limits is that young people. Young people don't have the memory, right, of the Second World War, which everyone keeps referring to, the so-called memory, but they also don't have a common historical base. Um, and I, I wish they did. I mean, I wish there was this 100-page book that everybody had to read, but there isn't such a book. Hmm. Time is running very fast. We have two minutes before we have to leave the room, but if you promise me to leave it very quickly, I will okay. admit two uh, questions. Cotton freeze and be very short okay. and focused. Okay, thank you, Kasia <laughs> Fisa, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Um, could it be an argument that we were taking, you know, by surprise by Russia in 2016, and we'll learn since then, and we'll also develop some counter tools, so we'll not be so vulnerable anymore in the future elections. Okay, and then we had one here, the guy with the black sweater. Um, after the you will get a microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, after the EU's election uh, yesterday, uh, there have been kind of two narratives. 
her narratives. Um, we don't like narratives <laughs> here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that um, one is that uh, uh, the central uh, part of politics is uh, kind of uh, weakened, and this is partly taken to be a kind of polarization. Uh, but also, people have uh, commented that it uh, means that there will be more room for deliberation and open discussion. Uh, what do you think? Okay, can we take, can we take okay. the question from the guy in the front and then in I'll, I'll the be front real here? fast. Yeah, I'll be, yeah. Just, just okay. I'll be real fast. Please, here. So. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is about um, kind of the politics of um, eternity and about what a lot of people my age feel that either they don't care about uh, who wins or they feel that it doesn't matter who wins. Uh, they're both wrong. Um, and it deals with also kind of the questions I felt uh, you were asked here, kind of the this what aboutism kind of questions. Obviously, Hillary was a lot better than Trump, but because we have seen a lot of stuff, um, it shows that no, she has done a lot of bad yeah. uh, things as well, maybe, right? So what sh should we do to make people that feel uh, that Hillary or you know, uh, <laughs> candidate X actually isn't yeah. that different from <coughs> candidate Y. How do we get out of that kind of vicious uh, cycle? Okay, so, so I'm, go I'm gonna try to be very brief. This is a problem, this is where the politics of inevitability has taken us because if you tell people it's all gonna be this kind of nice liberal dem no democratic outcome no matter what you do, then you educate a generation who thinks something like this, and then it's a very small step, and it's that like click from the politics of inevitability to the politics of eternity to say, well, since everything was going to be fine no matter what I did, everything's also going to be lousy no matter what I do, right? So it doesn't really make a difference. And I think the only way out of that, and it goes back to your question, is to is to instruct people that democracy actually is a matter of individual responsibility. I mean, this is where I get all conservative and ethical. You can't have a future without ethics, and you can't have democracy without ethics. And if people decide that they don't care, you have to be able to say, okay, that means you've been played and overwhelmed and you're on the losing side. But on my side, you know, we actually know that what we do makes a difference because it does. I mean, there the historical arguments are really strong that the actions of a few people can make a huge difference. Um, I mean, if all the, you know, if the, even in the US or the, or, or, or the UK and Brexit, I mean, if, if, if young people had actually just voted, they would have made a huge difference, right? And so anyway, um, and then I'm forgetting the other two questions that we learned from 2016. I think that's true to some extent. I mean, what I notice in Europe is that the deeper problems of digitalization may not quite have been fully understood because it's not, it's not just that the Russians came in, it's that the Russians, I think, took advantage of some deeper dynamics of the way that the internet gets us to think, which is that confirmation bias leads to polarization, right? And, and, get, and leads, pe makes people easier to demobilize. So I think that's true, and I've been trying to you know, contribute to that, so I hope that, I hope that you're right. But there, there, you know, whether it's the Russians or somebody else, there is, a, there is a question of what it's like to move into digital politics. And I'm forgetting the other question. Remind me real quick. Question. Oh, sorry, you're quite, I'm sorry. And this was about the center that has oh, been okay, uh, so in the European I'm elections. You, I'm gonna give you my version, and since you know, we're probably being recorded, then people can look at me later and laugh. But I, I actually don't, <laughs> I, I think this outcome is fine. I mean, I think the European Parliament has been the politics of inevitability for a long time, right? Like, we're, the, we're you know, we in the center are right, and everything's just a technical problem, and we're not really politicians. You know, we're just here, don't pay a lot of attention to us, right? Um, progress is inevitable, blah, blah, right? And now what you've got is you've got, I mean, an in, you got a parliament in Europe which a lot of people voted for, right? Had really high turnout. Mm. And you have people who say, you know, that whatever it is, the 25% or 30%, that we're skeptical of the whole thing. Okay, that's okay. The Republican Party is also skeptical of the United States of America, right? That's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, it's normal to have people who are skeptical, fine. And then you have roughly two thirds or a little bit less who are in favor of the European Union. And now you're gonna actually have to have political contestation. And I think that's fine, right? And by the way, I think it's, I find it personally very interesting that the Greens are doing so well, mm. because the Greens are the only guys who are talking about the future, right? And it was very interesting that like the AfD in Germany, 
commenting on the elections, they say, well, the Greens are our enemy. And I think like in a certain sense, that's right, because the AFDA is part of the populists who say, I mean, in general, taking your point, the populists who, 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 are, who don't really have a fresh version of the future, let's say, um, whereas the Greens, like that is their calling card. You know, that's, we have a version of the future. So I've, it's interesting that the Greens did so well. That might be being slightly overlooked. So I, I, don't, I look at these outcomes and I think that's, you know, that's pretty representative and, that, and it's good that people voted and maybe now we'll have some contestation and maybe from here on out, people will take what the European Parliament does more seriously. So maybe we're into the beginning of a virtuous cycle now. Okay, that's a positive note to end on. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, I would also oh, like to remind Thanks. you that you can buy the books, uh, particularly uh, uh, the last one, out, and you will get it signed before you leave. Okay. That's great. <laughs>